Good afternoon. Uh, I'm, I'm back, and that may be good, or it may be bad, <laughs> depending upon your point of view. But um, this presentation I'm going to do now is, is really a pleasure for me uh, to present to you some of the research that we have going on at uh, Barrow Neurological Institute. Uh, first, I'd like to kind of introduce uh, our team to you a little bit. Um, I'm the uh, new kid on the block. The opportunity uh, to work at Barrow has actually uh, promoted my move from the state of New Jersey to uh, Phoenix, Arizona uh, eight and a half weeks ago. So uh, it definitely was an opportunity I had my uh, eye on, and I'm, I'm very happy to say that uh, has come to fruition, it appears. But uh, our team consists of uh, Dr. Timothy Vollmer, uh, as well as Dr. Fudong Shi, um, as uh, two uh, key critical uh, researchers and clinicians, as far as Dr. Vollmer, in the area of multiple sclerosis, which is uh, our, our particular area of uh, research interest. Um, we have a, a host of individuals, uh, our clinical care coordinators, our laboratory technicians, fl flow technician, uh, postdoc fellow, and, and I round out the crew. There's a, a missing entity here in this, in this shot for sure, and, and that is the critical team uh, component, which is our subjects uh, with uh, living with and newly diagnosed with multiple sclerosis, who are so willing and so enthusiastic uh, to participate in the research uh, trials we have uh, available to them. So as I mentioned, the, the topic of our, our, our research uh, interests revolve around multiple sclerosis, which of course you know is an autoimmune disease of the nervous system. Where there is a immunological attack uh, on the oligodendrocyte, the myelin sheath surrounding the uh, axon, mainly a T-cell mediated uh, attack, although we're only uh, coming to know now how important perhaps the uh, B team or B cells uh, are in this whole process. But uh, for the most part, um, a, a T cell uh, immunological attack, it affects some 400,000 individuals in the US today, women greater than men, and predominantly young folks. Uh, the clinical course, uh, as you all well know, can present itself in various ways uh, for typical uh, uh, clinical, clinical course um, relapsing remitting, secondary progressive, primary progressive, or uh, progressive relapsing. The most common of which, as far as initial presentation, without question, is relapsing remitting multiple sclerosis. Now, we know that there are uh, target antigens in the central nervous system uh, in the process of multiple sclerosis, and they're well-characterized self-antigens. Uh, they include myelin basic protein, uh, PLP, which is proteolipid protein, myelin oligodendrocyte glycoprotein, or MOG, and myelin-associated glycoprotein. And there's more, but these are the, the, the critical players, critical antigens uh, toward which the T cell attack uh, takes place. The most well characterized is probably MBP or myelin basic protein. MBP directed uh, immunotherapy uh, decreases antigen specific immune response. So it decreases the immune attack against this particular antigen. And it certainly appears to be a safe and effective approach. We know, of course, that uh, one approved agent, one of five approved agents uh, for the treatment of MS, uh, is a compound cl called glutiramir acetate, formerly copolymer. And it essentially is a random polymer or stuck together uh, piece of four amino acids derived from the uh, very immunodominant or most uh, inciting part of the myelin basic protein uh, molecule. It is, as I say, approved for the treatment of MS uh, in the United States. How does it work? Well, I guess that's the real question that we're trying to get at, uh, and as one of the, focus, uh, uh, the focuses of our laboratory. Uh, there is certainly decrease in antigen-specific T cell response and something called a Th2 deviation. We'll get to that, what that means exactly in a moment. But why that is, I guess, is, is the question. There are other um, antigen-specific immunotherapies out there, altered peptide ligand, and as well as other uh, fragments of MVP which we uh, won't have time to get into. So let's speak for a second uh, and summarize for a moment uh, an, an understanding of what we mean by something called uh, Th1 versus Th2 immunity. Uh, can I have a show of hands? Have you heard these terms before? Yes, you've heard these terms, a few hands going up, okay. Basically, uh, we're talking about T helper cells or CD4 cells, and they come, if you will, in two flavors by virtue of the cytokines or chemical messengers they produce. The two flavors of these cells are Th1 and Th2. Th1 cells are, by definition, pro-inflammatory. They promote inflammation. 
by virtue of secreting IL-2, IL-12, IFN gamma, and TNF alpha, as well as other things. They activate macrophages and they generally promote cell mediated immunity. These are the problem cells in the area of MS. In contrast to TH2 uh, T helper cells uh, that are by definition anti inflammatory by virtue of the cytokines produced as listed on this table, they are more regulatory and they activate uh, predominantly B cell promoted humoral immunity and thus suppress in a sense, uh, cell-mediated immunity. Th1 cells mediate uh, disease in, in animal models, in animal models of MS. In MS lesions, for example, if you stain for the T cell receptor, it reveals that T cells infiltrate the perivascular area, cause inflammation. Th1 cells directed against uh, myelin antigens are the key mediators in MS uh, as we know it today. Th1 cytokines predominate in MS plaque, and Th1 cells mediate disease not only in, in people, but in our uh, mice model of multiple sclerosis called EAE. And we know that that is via myelin basic protein reactive T cells. Now, glutiramir has uh, a very high affinity for a groove in the T cell receptor. T cell receptor sits on the T cell, uh, if you can think of it as a cup or groove type structure and uh, glutiramir has a very, very high affinity and will stick into that TH, uh, that, that groove within the TCR called the MHC groove and it displaces other antigens. Or perhaps it's presented to t, t cells uh, by way of an antigen presenting cell. Either way, the result is a clonal expansion, dividing of that T cell to create an army, if you will, of TH2 bias cells. Now, the uh, GA-specific TH2 cells, when injected into mice, prevent the mice version of multiple sclerosis, or EAE, uh, when these animals are subsequently immunized, again, with um, spinal cord homogenates, and that is one way you elicit EAE in them. The key question is, why are these uh, GA-specific uh, T cells, TH2, biased? And that's the, the, the question at hand, and, and certainly I don't think uh, uh, the answer is clearly known for sure, and we're working towards that uh, through our various clinical trials. So one of the questions we have to ask is why we know that uh, glutiramir acetate does not prevent immune cells from entering the central nervous system, so then why do we see resolution of areas of inflammation, we call them GAD-enhancing lesions on MRI, uh, in the long run with uh, glutiramir acetate treatment? GA-specific TH2 cells in the periphery do, uh, do themselves enter the central nervous system early in the uh, treatment phase and, and they initiate and orchestrate a repair process from within the central nervous system by the following mechanism. It's a mechanism that has come to be known uh, uh, kind of party line as bystander suppression. That is the theory in which uh, uh, we believe that GA works. GA-specific TH2 cells uh, get reactivated once they're inside the central nervous system by antigen-presenting antigen cells such as microglia, uh, dendritic cells, perhaps B cells, uh, that uh, present uh, uh, like antigens and they get reactivated. And thus these educated TH2 cells can recognize a variety of different antigens in the central nervous system. And with the original design being the structure of myelin basic protein, Thus, you get an expansion of these GA or glutiramir acetate educated TH2 cells in the central nervous system. This is the theory. They, in turn, release anti inflammatory cytokines because they're TH2 cells. They impair the expansion uh, of the actual myelin reactive T cells. Thus, by in essence being bystanders, they act to suppress the uh, TH1 deviation that would normally be seen in MS plaque. So following this logic, glutiramir acetate should then be affected, uh, effective rather, in other autoimmune diseases. T cells, B cells, macrophages, they all produce neurotrophic factors. Okay? And these neurotrophic factors may uh, attenuate or lessen injury and have somewhat of a neuroprotective role. Another role of, of GA-specific cells is that there is evidence to suggest that they will improve survival of, for example, uh, in a retinal ganglion uh, model. Um, they will improve survival of, of, of neurons within that uh, animal model of retinal ganglion injury. And this may explain why we see 
a reduced proportion of what's called T1 black holes or areas of axon loss within the central nervous system uh, in MS patients. So why not ask the question or why not combine uh, the effects of the interferons perhaps with glutiramer acetate? Well, one thing we know is, of course, that the interferons work by blocking the inflammatory cells from entering the central nervous system. Interferons, however, may inhibit the expansion of glutiramer acetate-specific TH2 cells and thus uh, block their entrance, the ones you want to actually enter into the CNS, uh, block their entrance into the central nervous system, wi system where they would act through what's uh, the party line of bystander suppression. Possibly, though, an antimitotic agent prior to the, the delivery of glutiramer acetate may be helpful in eradicating the already present self-reactive Th1 cells, the bad cells, if you will, by making, uh, and thus allowing the expansion of Th2 cells better once the uh, glutiramer acetate is administered, creating a milieu for the expansion of the Th2 cells. So using a mitotic agent is certainly a question that we're trying to assess right now in one of our clinical trials. We actually have 27, lest I counted, clinical trials going on at BNI right now. So I was really trying to just focus this presentation to the things that we're, um, um, in a sense, most interested in and that are derived uh, uh, you know, from our laboratory originally. So our core functions of, of our, our BNI laboratory include our focus, which is uh, essentially immune-mediated medi disorders of the central nervous system, MS uh, at the top of the list, followed closely by neuromuscular junction, immune-mediated myasthenia gravis. We want to monitor how the uh, immune response responses are targeted by given uh, immunoregulatory drugs and to determine what the mechanism of action of these modulating agents are in human and animal models with the ultimate goal, of course, of optimization of clinical trials, <coughs> enhancing the potency of the drugs uh, in uh, themselves or in combination therapy. We aim to understand the nature of autoimmune diseases in general uh, as far as, for example, controlling initiation and progression of autoimmunity. And another aim uh, that our laboratory has is to educate folks for careers in neuroimmunology, and that's something we're doing uh, through uh, postdoctoral fellowships, clinical fellowships, uh, PhD students, and such. Now, what we've est established uh, in our laboratory are both uh, mice and uh, rat versions of uh, both uh, experimental MS and exp experimental myasthenia gravis. We've established uh, the following immune assays as listed there in order to accomplish these goals. And specific questions we have in mind are, are the following. If glutiramer acetate reactive Th2 cells, like regulatory cells, mediate by local bystander suppression, then their effect should not be or should not be limited to MS specifically or myelin basic protein specifically. But in fact, the, uh, the uh, glutiramer acetate should be beneficial, uh, have beneficial effects in other Th1 mediated like diseases such as myasthenia gravis, which is an autoimmune attack on the neuromuscular junction. Thus, we have our protocol called Therapeutic Effects of GA in Experimental Myasthenia Gravis, a disease induced mainly by immune attack on the acetylcholine receptor at the neuromuscular junction. And so this is one way to get at the question of whether bystander uh, suppression is, in fact, um, the method of action of uh, GA-trained uh, cells. We'd like to know how long GA-induced immune effects last, and thus we're looking at that with a uh, uh, sustained uh, clinical and immunological effects of glutiramer acetate in patients with RRMS or relapsing remittal, remitting MS. And we'd certainly like to know how, if in fact we can, boost the effect of glutiramer acetate. And so we're looking at co-immunization of uh, IFA or incomplete Frunz adjuvant and GA in a MOG-induced EAE animal model. These are some of the things that uh, we've been looking at in the area of of glutiramer acetate and trying to uh, evolve and understand the method of or mechanism of action. Transitioning to another trial uh, we are shortly going to have underway is something called uh, BHT3009 treatment of multiple sclerosis. And essentially, antigen specific immunosuppression is something that is well established. Obviously, we just talked about uh, glutiramer acetate pretty extensively. There's other ways to get at the same. Uh, goal, one of which is plasmids. Plasmids are essentially pieces of DNA. They're typically used, uh, in fact, to enhance immunity to a certain antigen, i.e. immunization. But in the right context, they certainly can be used for immunosuppression. 
This particular plasmid we're looking at uh, is uh, one that has a, a good safety profile, and uh, we are going to be carefully studying it. This uh, particular plasmid is one that encodes for human myelin basic protein, and that's the piece of DNA right there that is a human MBP. Everything else that's around this particular string and circle of DNA are simply uh, uh, promoter regions, regions that have allowed the uh, um, evolution of this within an E. coli bacterium. That's how it's uh, developed. And then, of course, the E. coli is lysed and, and all other bacterial components are, are gone. So the, the end product is only the production of human myelin basic protein. All uh, immunostimulatory sequences are, are removed. In an animal model, this particular plasmid, in looking at uh, the typical five-point scale of animal paralysis and EAE, it's been shown both to reduce disease incidence and severity uh, in the animal models tested. And once again, uh, in uh, a different set, you have a reduction in uh, mean disease scores using a typical five-point scale, as well in relapse rate uh, in an EAE model. Uh, the toxicity and safety profiles, uh, as far as the preclinical data, uh, is, is uh, quite optimistic with this particular plasmid. And we're going to be looking at it in conjunction with a statin drug, specifically a torvastatin. A torvastatin in, in itself has mild uh, anti-inflammatory effects. It, it is known to shift uh, the um, T cell uh, arena, again, from the harmful Th1 to the, not, to the uh, regulatory Th2 arm. There's early evidence, uh, certainly for its efficacy in the statins in general, uh, in treating MS, and in, in fact, we believe it may improve the efficacy uh, of this uh, plasmid vaccine. So there is certainly uh, data and efficacy to support uh, a, a DNA vaccine, uh, where it's going to be administered uh, either biweekly or monthly. Uh, typically, in the, in the uh, animal models, it was administered rather biweekly or monthly. And uh, there's really little concerns as far as uh, safety and the toxicity profiles have been quite good. So we enter into a placebo-controlled uh, trial of this uh, DNA vaccine uh, alone or in combination with the torvastatin in patients with multiple sclerosis. We're one of several uh, sites uh, participating in this study. Three arms, randomized, double-blind, uh, placebo-controlled. There'll be a crossover uh, from placebo to active uh, at the end. And essentially, uh, the subjects are, will be enrolled and randomized into placebo group, into the uh, DNA vaccine alone, or the DNA vaccine uh, in combination with the statin. Uh, it'll be a 14-week protocol, and then the uh, active uh, uh, crossover of placebo group to uh, active um, vaccine uh, and atorvastatin. And of course, the uh, objectives of the study are to assess uh, safety, determine uh, it's actually a combined phase one, phase two response, uh, or rather study. And uh, we want to look at the immune response. So we're going to look looking at immunological uh, parameters. We're going to describe clinical course and explore the biomarkers of uh, MS activity. So we're going to transition uh, a little further uh, and talk about another study which involves a, a compound uh, called famperidine. Uh, 4-aminopyridine is the uh, chemical name or affectionately known as 4-AP. 4-AP is uh, a compound that does cross the blood-brain barrier. It blocks fast-acting voltage-gated uh, potassium channels. We talked a bit this morning about sodium channels, about calcium channels, and now we're at potassium channels. Uh, it uh, will cause prolongation of the action potential and allow for, for an uh, electrical activity to prolong itself long enough to actually get the action potential to propagate down the axon, which is something that is problematic when the axon has been denuded or, or myelin coating has been destroyed uh, on any particular uh, neural fiber. So you have obviously possible enhancement of synaptic transmission and improved uh, electrical transmission through the nerve. Looking at a nerve for a moment, uh, the anatomy of such of, of the uh, axon with its myelin coating, the, uh, the spots between the myelin uh, sheathings are called nodes of Ranvier, and 
we'll see that a particular neural impulse would typically, in a, in a uh, normal axon with myelin uh, uh, coding, would jump from node to node to node for fast saltatory conduction down the axon. Now, unfortunately, once the myelin has been uh, denuded, thin, destroyed, um, attacked, uh, whichever term you'd like to use, there is unfortunately leak of current through these uh, open and available potassium channels that are present on the internodal regions uh, of the axon most dramatically. And so what you have is loss of electrical current and thus the, the conduction of the electrical response from this point to this one is slowed and inefficient. With famperdine, uh, in theory, these, these open uh, potassium channels are blocked such that any particular uh, neural uh, um, message uh, or, or neural response would conduct in a typical fast manner across the denuded area of, of myelin or without myelin. So we see that famperdine was first looked at clinically in MS back in the 80s. Uh, there was a series of studies, uh, the first large study being in 1993 with 70 patients in MS. And essentially they looked uh, and concluded that there were broad effects on disability using the EDSS uh, as one of the outcome measures. The dose and serum levels remain relative, uh, related, were related directly in fact to efficacy and safety. And plasma level varied and difficult to control with the immediate release form of famperdine. The uh, immediate release tablets, as I said, uh, were were uh, available at that point in time, but subsequently sustained release forms were developed. These were well tolerated in doses up to 50 milligrams a day. They reach and achieve peak concentration gradually and last longer you know, with well-maintained drug effect in a twice a day dosing. So it's the sustained release form that has now been looked at. Proprietarily, uh, it was uh, um, developed by Elan and then Accorda Therapeutics licensed the formulation from Elan and it's been advanced through uh, clinical trial development both in spinal cord injury and MS. And what we see uh, in the very early study uh, was that a, uh, looking at walking speeds, so time to walk eight meters uh, in the study population for all subjects that participated, there was uh, significantly improved, uh, uh, improved walking speeds on those to, on the medication. In a later study, using a 25-foot walk uh, change in speed from baseline, there was uh, a statistically significant with 20 to 50 milligrams per day dosing of the sustained release tablet, uh, improved walking speeds for the 25-foot distance uh, uh, in those uh, on drug versus placebo. Thus, we participated in uh, MSF202, which uh, included clinically definite persons with multiple sclerosis between the ages of 18 and 70. They had to be able to complete two trials of a timed 25-foot walk at the screening visit with the average time had to be to complete, uh, to, to be entered into the study between 8 and 60 seconds. So they had to be ambulatory uh, within uh, this time period for a 25-foot walk. Their primary endpoint was percent change and improvement in walking speed uh, during the stable dosing period relative to baseline. And this is just the study design. There were three different doses uh, of famperdine and then the placebo arm. And the conclusions were that there was a consistent trend on uh, in improved walking speeds of the 25-foot walk, uh, and that was in the planned analysis. Statistically significant uh, um, improvement of walking speeds on both the 10 milligram BID and 15 milligram BID versus placebo. Uh, there were also significant improvements in lower extremity manual muscle testing. So strength of individual muscles tested in the lower extremities uh, with a favorable um, uh, um, adverse event uh, profile for both the 10 and 15 milligram BID dosing. And so both are considered candidates for future development and they are currently doing more analyses uh, to take a look at this, but I think uh, at least it has uh, continued potential uh, for the use uh, in this particular diagnostic category. And I think that that pretty much gets us back uh, on time sequence. I wanted to share with you uh, one of the reasons why I moved to Phoenix, and that's certainly the view, uh, or the uh, state of Arizona, rather, the view of the Grand Canyon. Uh, having visited it a couple weeks ago, certainly uh, had more pictures than I knew what to do with, so I had to throw one in. Thank you for your time, and I'll be uh, at, uh, at uh, the back of the room there to answer any questions you might have so our next speaker can get started.